after a reading like that, I like to say somewhere in that is the word of God. Let's pray. God, help us to understand and to practice love without judgment. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Do we have any Garth Brooks fans here? Come on, there's got, oh, there's a couple. Oh, a few more popping up. Oh, yeah. Okay, good. He's been in the news for a bit, a couple of weeks now, because he has a bar in Nashville called Friends in Low Places. And he announced that they are continuing to sell Bud Light beer. Now, do we have any Bud Light fans? Couple of us brave enough? All right. <laughs> did I get some thumbs down back there? Oh, yeah, I did. All right. Bud Light has also been like a staple, the way that Garth Brooks was a staple of country music, right, and is. Bud Light's been a staple at, at bars forever, right? Until about a month ago or so. I'm not sure when it happened, but they, uh, the cans featured the face of a transgender person. Dylan Mulvaney's face was on the can of Bud Light, and that caused all kinds of backlash from conservatives, right? They refused to go to bars that sold Bud Light, and they demanded that bars stopped serving it because this transgender person's face was on the can. To all of that, uh, Garth Brooks made a statement that his bar, Friends in Low Places, would continue to sell Bud Light. And he said, our thing is this, if you come into this house, love one another. But if you're a blankety blank, there are plenty of other places to go. Now his comments upset some of his fans so much that they said, we're gonna go home and burn all of our Garth Brooks merchandise. To them, Brooks responded, everybody's got their opinions, but inclusiveness is always going to be me. I think diversity is the answer to the problems that are here and the answer to the problems that are coming. So I love diversity, all inclusive, so all are welcome. Why does the face of a transgender person on a beer can make people so angry? Why can't we just say, well, that's a face. Everybody has a face. God loves all of us. So come on in. Doors are open. I'm hoping that our reading, as strange as this may sound, will help us to understand this a little bit. Now let's start one chapter before our reading today to get a little context. Genesis chapter 18 our friends, Abraham and Sarah, remember them? They are in their tent and three visitors show up. At first, Abraham does not seem to know that these visitors are God and two angels. Abraham rushes out in this show of grand hospitality, which was normal for that culture. And he invited these visitors to stop, to stay with him, to rest, wash their feet, get something to eat before they continue on their way. And they do. Sarah bakes bread and Abraham brings water and he serves them and they have conversation. And then the two that are angels go on to the city of Sodom while God stays in human form and talks to Abraham. And God says to himself actually, or herself, God says, should I tell Abraham what I'm about to do? Should I tell Abraham that the outcry of people against the city of Sodom is so great that I am going there to find out how bad it really is? And if it's as bad as I understand it to be, I'm going to wipe that city out. And Abraham, of course, is listening to this, and, and he responds with um, a lot more confidence, I think, than some of us might have. He says to God, well, what if there's 50 righteous people in that city? Far be it for you, God, to wipe out the 50 righteous with all of the unrighteous. So God says, eh, if there's 50, I'll save the city. Then Abraham bargains to 40 and 30 and 20 and finally 10. God, if there's 10 people that are righteous in that city, far be it from you 
to wipe out those 10 righteous with all of the unrighteous. And God says, all right, if there's 10, 10 people that are righteous in that city, I will spare the whole place. And then God goes on God's way. Now, scholars agree that Abraham is already thinking about his nephew Lot. Lot and Lot's family live in Sodom. So Abraham is trying to be very polite in suggesting to God that God not wipe out the city because Lot and his family are there. Abraham has family there, and he wants to protect the family. The thing I want you to notice here is that whatever the sin of Sodom is, it has already happened and been happening before our story today. All right? So there's something in this city that has been happening for a while. It is not based just on this text that we heard Linda read for us today. So the two angels have gone on to Sodom and they enter the center of the city, the town square. I shouldn't use the word city, village maybe would be a, give us a better image. But they come to the center and they wait there. Now, this was customary, right? There are no Motel 6s, there's no Holiday Inns, there's no Bob Evans, there's no place for the travelers to go. They always went to the center of the city and then they waited for someone to offer hospitality. If no one took them in and fed them and let them rest, it might cost them their lives eventually as they travel because they depend on one another to help them, to, to get food for them, to give them a place to rest. While they're in the center of town, Lot comes. This is Abraham's nephew, and he says, you must come to my house. And he offers hospitality, opens his doors to these strangers. And if you read the actual text, the angels say, no, that's okay. We'll just wait it out here. Because they're on a mission, right? God has sent them there. They want to see what happens to them if they wait in the town square. But Lot, we don't know if Lot knows what's going to happen to them. It, the text doesn't tell us that, but he insists, you must come and stay with me. And they agree. They go to Lot's home, the door is closed behind them, and then very soon a mob of men, young and old it says, every man in Sodom comes to the door, bangs on the door and says, where are those two men? Bring them out so we may know them. That's what the story says. We may know them. Now, my first question is, where were all these guys five minutes ago when the angels were in the center of town? We don't know. But once they're in Lot's home, they're all outside the door and they're banging on the door. Now, when it says we want to know them, that is ambiguous. Most translations will say where are those men? We want to have sex with them, which actually is we want to rape them. This is a violent act. It is not about any kind of sexual intimacy, right? But that word no is used in the Hebrew text a thousand times probably, again and again and again. And in only a handful of places does it mean anything about knowing someone intimately, as in Adam knew Eve, and the next thing we know, there's a baby. That kind of knowing we understand. This sentence, we want to know them, does not tell us what kind of knowing that is. However, uh, in I think it was the eighth century, scholar Mark Jordan um, suggests that that's when the interpretation of uh, a sexual violence came into play. It wasn't there when Jesus knew this text. It wasn't there for the early Christian church. No one had that understanding until the Middle Ages. Now, maybe rape is what's intended here. And if it is, I want you to remember that rape is never about sex. It is always about violence. It is about brutality, about domination, about humiliating someone. It in no way, shape, or form represents any sexual expression from the LGBTQ community. It in no way represents any same-sex relationship. This is an act of 
brutality that throughout history we see, well, we probably don't see it because it's covered up, but when uh, people groups are fighting, the winner would rape the losers. It wasn't because they wanted to have sex with them. It wasn't because they had any kind of gender confusion. It was because they wanted to dominate them. They wanted to hurt them. So however you want to read this story, what we understand about same-sex relationships, gender expression, any kind of sexual expression, it's not here. This is about brute force. Or maybe the men of Sodom didn't intend that at all. We can't know for sure if we look at the original Hebrew here, okay? So if we don't know what this story is about, I mean, how do we find out, right? Uh, there's a reason it was in the Bible. There's a reason that the Hebrew people told this story around the campfire. That's how it was, it was shared. We have to go to Ezekiel and to Jesus to find out what the sin of Sodom was because there's nowhere else. Isaiah mentions it in a long section. It's, it sounds more like injustice, but today I want us to just go to Ezekiel. It's chapter 16, uh, starting in verse 49. Ezekiel has God speaking here, and God says, this was the sin of, or the guilt of your sister Sodom. She and her daughters had pride, excess of food and prosperous ease, but did not aid the poor and needy. She had everything she needed. All the inhabitants of Sodom had every good thing, but when travelers came through and asked for help, they refused them. So according to Ezekiel, the, the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah is that they did not share, they did not show the extravagant hospitality that Abraham just modeled for us in the prior chapter. So now let's go to the New Testament and see what Jesus said about Sodom and Gomorrah. This is Matthew chapter 10, uh, starting in verse 14. Jesus has just sent out his disciples two by two into the community, the surrounding area, to heal and to preach and to teach and to share the good news that God's love is here for all of us and the kingdom of heaven is right here within reach. And Jesus says this to his disciples, if anyone will not welcome you or listen to your words, leave that home or town and shake the dust off your feet. Truly I tell you, it will be more bearable for Sodom and Gomorrah on the day of judgment than for that town. So if we just don't let the disciples come in and talk to us, I mean, how many times have you had a Jehovah's Witness at your door? Huh? Will it be worse for you if you don't open the door to people who are bringing you good news? At least according to them, right? Their version of good news. This is scathing. If that is worse than the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah, I cannot imagine. I, it's it's mind-boggling. But I think if we look at the whole picture, if we look at the, the demonstration of Abraham and the extreme hospitality, Lot, who opens his door, and Ezekiel's note about Sodom, not sharing with the stranger, with the needy, and Jesus saying, if no one welcomes you, that's worse than the sin of Sodom. The sin is in hospitality. The doors are closed. We have our own group, our own clique, we have easy life, and you stay out. That's the sin. It is in hospitality. Um, my professor in, in uh, seminary, that was one of his main points. We didn't spend a lot of time on this text, but he said everything points to in hospitality. Why is hospitality so important to God? It is not about good manners, by the way. If you're thinking that it means that we're gonna put on an apron and bake little cupcakes and invite everyone, that is not what I'm talking about here. Hospitality in that day was a matter of life and death. If we didn't let the stranger come in 
If we didn't share what we had, they could die. They would have to go on somewhere else. You can only go so far. You depend on the people around you. If you stopped in Sodom, you did not get fed. You didn't get a place to stay. You got attacked. And that was the sin of Sodom. Now, why was Lot spared? Because he was at the end. Um, the angels hustled Lot and his wife and two daughters out. He opened his doors to the angels, right? He showed hospitality to the traveler. Now, we are going to ignore for today that unfortunate incident that Linda read about where Lot actually goes outside the door, closes it behind him and says, hey, leave these kind gentlemen alone and take my two virgin daughters and do whatever you want with them. And Lot's the righteous one here? Okay, don't get me started. Um, if, you, if you are bored today, like if it rains, find your Bible, read Genesis 19 because at the end, those girls ruin Lot's life. They don't do it on purpose, but there are consequences to our actions. There are consequences. It's not judgment, it's a consequence. If we don't show hospitality to the stranger, the stranger dies and we die. That's what this whole story is about. That, if, if you wanna boil it down to one sentence, well, yeah, I guess I can do that. Let me see. I wrote it down, and it was so good when I wrote it down, and now I can't find it. The story is saying, if you do not open your doors and share with those in need, they will die, and so will you, because that's what happened at Sodom, okay? Now, um, when we receive LGBTQ persons into our worship, into everything, all of our events, when we do that, we are also saving lives. We are saving their lives. I wanna share with you some statistics. Uh, when churches label youth, LGBTQ youth, as sinful and as abomination, they become suicidal. Listen to this statistic. This is from 2023 U.S. National Survey on the Mental Health of LGBTQ Young People, as reported at the Trevor Project website. 41%, 41% of LGBTQ youth have seriously considered suicide in the last 12 months. 41%. Now, are they suicidal because they are part of the LGBTQ community? No, they are suicidal because their families are not safe places for them. Their own house might not be safe. Their schools are not accepting and loving. Our government often is not accepting and loving. I mean, look at Florida, look at Indiana. Some of the legislation that has been passed there tells them that they are not welcome. That's why they're suicidal. I'm not trying to yell at y'all. You are doing a great job. We have the doors open here. I want you to understand why it's important to have the doors open. Why it's important to read the text the way it is and not read our own generations of teaching into it. Letting the word of God stand as the word of God. And if that's the case, this is all about hospitality. And many of our young people are committing suicide or thinking about suicide because of church and religious doctrine. Because we have told them they're not good enough. And we need to change that because we are killing them. And it's time for us to step up and take responsibility. Ah, here's my sentence. The story of Sodom is not about judgment. It is about consequence. It's simply telling us that when we do not practice hospitality, people die. So if you don't take away anything else, take away that. If we do not practice hospitality as God commands us to do, people die. And that is what this story is about. A hospice doctor said this on a website called Quotes from the Dying. 
He said, I've heard a lot of patients' final words be about the regret they have for disowning their LGBTQ children and about the relationships they could have had. Unfortunately, rigid, rigid religious and political dogma tears apart more families than most people realize. Life is short. Accept people, especially the ones you love, for who they are and not who we want them to be. Now, I was not here when all of you went through the open and affirming process here. I hope that all of this was review, but I don't know. And I've heard enough conversation, a few questions here and there that makes me wonder if we need to talk more about this. Um, I heard that at least one of your elders left the church over that open and affirming uh, vote. And I have heard that some members have also left over that. Why? Why are people leaving churches that are opening their doors to everyone? Why are Garth Brooks fans burning their merch, right? Why is that happening? And I think it comes back to what we've been talking about all month, that there are two stories of God and one of those stories says God is judgment. And if we believe that God is judgment, we will keep those doors locked because we will be living in fear. If we understand that God is love, that other story of God that does not go with the story that God is judgment, if we understand that God is a God of love for everybody, we can open our doors because we are not living in fear. We are not worried about who's going to show up. We are not worried about losing the fabric of our church. We understand that it's all about love and it's only ever been about love. So it comes back to those two stories. So if you have friends and family who might say, how can you go to a church that has a rainbow painted on the fence? Or how can you go to a church that says that this isn't a sin when my Bible says it's a sin? I want you to understand that they are coming from that viewpoint that God is judgment. And they are living in fear. They cannot step outside the lines. As Garth Brooks said, you know, if you can't do it, if, if you don't like it, there are other places you can go. And unfortunately, that's where we're at too, because this has to be a place that's open and loving to all. And as I said, you've done a great job. I've been so proud of all of you, but I do want you to understand why it's important. So if you have questions, if you have concerns, if you have ideas, if you have anything at all about that open and affirming process that you went through, what, 10 years ago? I don't even know how long it's been. If, you, if you're comfortable, come talk to me, because I want to know. And if you're not comfortable talking about it, you've got little cards in, in the pews. Write down your question or your concern and drop it in that, that mailbox back there so I can get it. If you're on Zoom, email me. I just want to know, because we can have a conversation about this. We can go back through all of the so-called clobber passages um, that our religious conservative friends have used. Uh, to prove that God hates same-sex relationships and any expression of sexuality outside the cultural norm. And I think I can prove the opposite. So if you want to talk more about it, please let me know. And we'll, we won't do it at the pulpit because this is a touchy subject, but we will sit down together, maybe have lunch, and we'll talk. So let me know if that's something that you want to do. Now, since we started with Garth Brooks, let's end there. Uh, he said in an interview... So here's the deal, man. If you want to come to friends in low places, come in. But come in with love. Come in with tolerance. Come in with patience. Come in with an open mind. And that's cool. And if you're one of those people that just can't do that, I get it, he said. If you ever are one of those people who wants to try, come. Let's be the church that is at least as welcoming as a bar.